You guys, do you know what the deadliest animal is on the planet? I didn't. I mean, I thought I might. From all the like movies and TV shows, I was kind of thinking sharks, but that's not it. Uh, It turns out sharks kill about five people a year. However, mosquitoes are the deadliest animals on the planet by a long shot. And obviously their biggest threat, malaria. My guest today teaches us all about malaria and also why there's reason for hope. All right, Dr. Akumo, you have one sentence to make me care about malaria. Malaria affects all of us because of its impacts on global economic growth, its impact on health, its impact of travel. And I think the best way to summarize it is that let's just say it's better to be alive than to be dead. We can say that. Okay, I am in agreement with you. That said, can you tell me more? First of all, this is a disease for which we have known how to treat it. We have known how to prevent it for more than 100 years. Mm. And yet we still have every year more than 250 million cases, more than 600,000 deaths, most of them African children. Okay, wait, Fredros. So 600,000 people, most of them children. So by the numbers, that's almost 2,000 people a day. And so that's something like as if five planes full of people crashed every single day, mostly with children on board. Those numbers are actually really hard for me to even comprehend. Created in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this is Make Me Care About. I'm Jen Hatmaker, and with me is Dr. Fred Rosakumu, Director of Science at the Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania. And today, Dr. Akumu is helping us care about malaria. Hi, Fred Ros. Hey, Jen. So here is my first question for you. Can you expand a little bit on what the downstream effects of malaria are on, first of all, both the affected countries and then, of course, the rest of the world. This is a disease for which we have the right medication. We have tools to prevent it. But because it's associated with poverty and then it's in very low income communities, mostly it's kind of a very neglected disease. So there is something to do with dignity that is important there that I think we can talk about as well. But mostly it's the loss of lives. The second is just loss of work hours. So when you're sick, you're unable to go to work. Children are unable to go to school. All this together computes towards the economic losses. I think I know the answer to this, but are there particular groups that are disproportionately affected by malaria? There there are many people who say that, yes, indeed, malaria is transmitted by a mosquito and is caused by a parasite. But that is only partly true. Malaria is mostly a disease of low-income households, of communities that have the poorest access to good health care. So I think that that's something that we cannot deal with simply by distributing bed nets. It is something that requires a much more holistic engagement in these communities. That kind of brings us back to a word you mentioned a minute ago, which is dignity. And that has a place in this conversation that yes, we can easily and specifically talk about the economic impact of malaria on countries in the world abroad. But there is a dignity question at its center that also bears our attention. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Jen, I think the best way to summarize this is that all lives have equal value. Now, when you have a situation where uh, certain countries or certain communities have greater access to the same medication, to the same prevention, to finances that you need to do this than the low-income families. Then you start asking yourself, are they your children of a lesser God? And even when they speak, the voice that they project does not carry the same weight. So, so I think that we have put ourselves in a situation where we can choose which diseases we want to prioritize on the basis of where those diseases are most prevalent. 
We can choose where to put resources on the basis of which demographic is most affected. And this is true at global scale, but it's also true in my own country, because if we had a disease that was killing mostly adult people, there would be greater attention to that disease than a disease that is killing mostly children. And similarly, at global level, you could say that if malaria was still in the North or in the West, that there would be greater resources, just as much as we've seen for COVID. What are some of the tools that malaria endemic countries have at their disposal to fight this disease and how effective are they? The main tools for malaria control really are the following. Number one are insecticide treated bed nets. Those insecticides can kill mosquitoes that attempt to bite you when you're sleeping. The second main intervention that we use is spraying of houses. A lot of the mosquitoes that transmit malaria like to bite people inside the house and then rest in the walls of those houses. And when they do that, they can be killed by this insecticide. Finally, we have some very good medications available around the world. If you get them at the right time, you get the right diagnosis, there is like 97% cure rate for this. So we need good diagnostics for that and then good treatment for this. So those three things are the main interventions that countries are using at the moment. Let me ask you this. How is climate change affecting malaria? What we can say for a fact is that the changing environment, the changing climates, the changing land use patterns are impacting the suitability of different locations to have malaria. The changing climate, for example, is making it easier for mosquitoes to survive in certain areas because they are warming up. If a previously forested area becomes inhabited because, you know, other people are escaping the impact of climate change, that they convert these environments that were otherwise previously normal areas to become malaria. Lastly, one of the most notorious malaria mosquitoes in Africa is what we call Anopheles gambi. It likes to breed in small water bodies. So you can imagine if you have an extended period of drought, these water bodies might disappear. And that makes life very difficult for this individual mosquito. Okay, so... We have learned some pretty sobering statistics, actually, about malaria, but I'm excited about the second half of this conversation. Stick around because we're going to get into what would happen if we just killed all the mosquitoes. Then, of course, always my favorite section of the discussion, which is let's talk about solutions. And they exist. So created in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this is Make Me Care About. I'm Jen Hatmaker. Hi, I'm Dr. Samir Kumta, Senior Program Officer for Tuberculosis in India at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I joined the Gates Foundation 14 years ago to work on HIV prevention. More recently, I've been working on tuberculosis or TB. TB treatment is long drawn with side effects. And in India, where I'm from, there are 3 million new cases of TB every year and 500,000 deaths. Our work at the Gates Foundation supports innovative models for patients to access care at private medical clinics with free diagnostics and drugs for treatment. And we are partnering with the Indian government to scale up these models to eliminate TB by 2025. At the end of the day, it's greatly fulfilling for me to see patients complete treatment and go on to lead healthy, productive lives. If you found today's episode inspiring and want to learn more about the amazing work of our partners, visit us at gatesfoundation.org and sign up for our newsletter, The Optimist. Created in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this is Make Me Care About. I'm Jen Hatmaker, and with me today is Dr. Fredros Akumu. Director of Science at the Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania. And today, Fredros is helping us care about malaria. Welcome back, Fredros. Now, I'd like to hear you talk about this, explain it a little bit. Should we just kill all the mosquitoes that carry malaria using gene drive? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, and, and I see now you start to be interested in specific technologies and I... Oh, well, I've done some homework. Yeah, Americanness is starting to show. <laughs> It leaks out. It does. It seeps out. (laughs) You love to. (laughs) So, of course, the genetic modification of mosquitoes is a potential option. The the data that we have from laboratories suggests that, yes, indeed, it is possible to modify mosquitoes so that either they do not transmit malaria 
it is also possible to modify these mosquitoes so that they no longer reproduce. We have to continue doing scientific research on this and say, could there be a negative impact that as yet we still do not know? But at the bare minimum, it's promising. Uh, A lot of the folks listening into this conversation are American. And so as you have explained, while malaria may be primarily located in certain regions and countries, it is a global issue. How likely would you say it is for an average American traveling abroad to maybe encounter malaria? Well, an average American traveling to a malaria endemic country will very likely catch malaria. Okay, so let's let's just so put that out there. That's an easy answer. Let's just put that one right <laughs> on the nose. Uh, the answer is highly likely. You come to my village and you are unprepared. Of course, these insects will bite you and you could potentially catch malaria. Now, the question is what happens after that? Because often American travelers are some of the most prepared travelers. They, they have taken their prophylaxis. They are wearing mosquito repellents. You know, they are sleeping under bed nets. It means, therefore, that the likelihood of them suffering a negative impact from a malaria infection is very low. There are actually things you can do to prevent yourself from getting malaria. And if you get malaria, there are things you can do to prevent yourself from dying. And a typical American tourist has access to these things when they visit my village. And so when you ask me this question, I start to think, how do we extend that same access that you have, Jen, when you come to my village, so that the 1,000 kids who live in my village have the same access? I love that approach to look at a possible solution through the lens of tourism and global travel. I am curious, because you are a very smart and fancy global scientist, let's say an American contracts malaria, we likely have all the resources we need to treat it. Can you walk me through the process of both a malaria diagnosis and then treatment or lack thereof if you are in an under-resourced country and probably under the age of five. The health system weaknesses that we have, it's improved a lot in the last few years, but there are still a lot of weaknesses here. So if I get sick, uh, if I get infected with malaria, the first sign I usually see is I start to have fevers, right? For the best results, I need to be able to go to a health facility as soon as possible, within the first day or late at worst two days. It's not guaranteed that everybody is within a reasonable access in all communities. In some communities, they are very lucky that maybe 80% are within 10 kilometers, but you don't have modes of transport. So you're talking about walking distance. Assuming that you get access to that health facility, it could be the most peripheral dispensary. You are hoping that they have a diagnostic, that they can tell you what exactly you are sick of. Even if they give you the correct diagnostic, that it is malaria, it is not guaranteed that they will have the medication for you. And finally, if you get the medication, you know, it's not a single tablet. It's a series of of tablets. If it's kids, it depends also on the severity. Uh, Sometimes you need to be kept in the hospital. We need, sometimes you need a testinate injections if it's a severe malaria case and and so on and so forth. So overall, you see a situation where even if you had a medicine as we have today that has like 97% cure rate, the actual effectiveness, even the health system weaknesses goes sometimes down to as low as 37 40%. 40%. Mm-hmm. If we decided as a global community, enough's enough. We've got this one in hand. We know what to do and we have the money to do it. What would the impact be on both local and global economies? It's important for the global economy that we are safeguarding the livelihoods of the young people because this really is how we are going to sustain humanity going forward. You know, there was a 40% chance that I would die on the first year and that either myself or my mother would die on the day I was born. You know, we survived that period, myself and many other colleagues. That investment is paying off now because I can stand up for my country. I can train a lot of other people. But this never gets computed by economists. What good news for the world to have hundreds of thousands of children live into adulthood and unleash their very special brands of brilliance and creativity and innovation to the world. That's reason enough. That is reason enough. Now, as we probably look at every possible angle to address malaria, let's figure it out by hook or by crook, like in any which way we can do it. And so that brings me to my last question for you. Do you think that total 
malaria eradication is possible in our lifetime? And if so, what are we going to have to do to make it happen? The answer is yes. The question is, can we actually do it? I think we can. It will take a lot of marshalling of resources. But, you know, I've seen greater things happen in this world. I've seen countries come together to do some fantastic rollback. I mean, HIV is an is a good example. You've seen what has happened with the COVID-19 vaccinations. Together with the people of America and the people of my country, I am sure we can raise the necessary resources and put in the energies and the brilliance of many young people around the world to make this happen. So, you guys, I will confess, I really, frankly, didn't think much about malaria Unless and until I was traveling to a place where I had to take malaria pills. But Dr. Akumu actually reminded me today of something I hold dear, which is that at the end of the day, this is about dignity and respect and just basic care for one another. It's not okay that hundreds of thousands of children die every year from something we know how to prevent right? This is not okay. We just need to decide it matters enough to protect them. All kids are our kids. So we can do this. We really, really can. Make Me Care About is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise. Our production staff includes Sabrina Farhi, Hewate Katana, Julia Natt, and Kristen Muller. Our executive producer is Eric Newsom, and I'm the host, Jen Hefmaker. To learn more about Dr. Fred Rosakuma's work, please check out the show notes. And if you liked this episode, follow the show to hear more things to care about. Also, we'd be grateful if you could share this episode with a friend. 